Okay, continuing work on the horizontal stabilizer. So in the last video, I assembled a bunch of the substructure, and in this one, I'm going to be assembling the substructure into the skins. So there's a very specific order that you have to do all this in, uh, so that you always have access to the, the inside of each rivet as you're setting it, so that you can form the shop head. And what that pretty much means is, in general, you're working from the leading edge back. So of course, in this orientation, with them in the with the skins in the cradles, and the leading edge down, that means you're working basically from the bottom up. So here you can see I'm clicking in place uh, the nose ribs down into the leading edge, and uh, I'll talk for a minute about the cradles and the you know the rag I'm stuffing in there and all that. So uh, some folks might notice that these are different cradles than the ones I used uh, earlier on working on the horizontal stabilizer. In fact, you can see some of the older ones with the straps, the luggage straps that I made uh, on the table in the background. And while those, the ones with the straps allow some freedom of movement, and I'll actually go back to them later on in the process, for the steps that I'm doing right now, I really, I decided to go back and make the cradles the way the plans described, where you trace the ribs and have a cradle that much more closely matches the airfoil shape that you're you know that you're trying to, to build out here and the reason for that is when you've got just these nose ribs and you're trying to get those clicoed in place the skins really are trying to spread back out with a good bit of force and the nose ribs just just the nose ribs are not really enough to to kind of hold them <laughs> uh, on their own without you know the cradles holding the skins tightly in and it'll just it'll bend those flanges on the nose ribs so even with the cradles uh there were times when i had to stuff that rag in there to you know to kind of help push things in and, and keep it flush uh, to do the riveting so here you can see i'm uh you know putting rivets i think i went back and forth alternating sides started at the at the very leading edge and worked my way back um, bucking these rivets and again even with the tighter cradles and uh, you know the rag to, to stuff in there I found that as I got up higher I guess back toward you know the flanges right by where the spar will be uh, farther away from the, the very tip of the leading edge the skins were spreading a little bit and it was uh, hard to keep the skin flush up against the flange and so I'll, I'm, I'll show a still here and then here you can see the gap between the skin and the flange and you can see the rivet in there and that one on the right the rivet's not set yet of course but you can see the problem I was having and I ended up resorting to a trick I, I think I read either on a forum or in a magazine somewhere uh, that actually worked really well and what I did is I took a piece of tubing a piece of as I should actually model airplane fuel tubing is what I happen to have and cut a little piece of tubing that was just a tiny bit longer than the the part of the let's see the rivet shank that's you know extending out there you know before it's set and that way when I when I go and I squeeze the bucking bar and the rivet gun you know squeeze them and hold them in place before I buck the rivet that little piece of fuel tubing around the shank of the rivet pushes the parts together and holds them there while I start to buck the rivet. And then of course, as you buck the rivet, the fuel tubing is, is elastic. It's, it just spreads out and the shop head forms you know, inside this tubing. And you can pop the rivet a couple of times, you know, a few times enough that you know that it's starting to set and starting to expand and it's gonna hold the parts together on its own. And then you can take the little piece of tubing off and uh, you know, finish setting the rivet the rest of the way or whatever. And that worked great. Um, you know, you don't have to use it on every single one, only in ones where you're having a hard time holding the parts tightly together. Uh, and again, I wish I could have filmed it and gotten a, gotten a good video of it. I may try to do that uh, another time. But of course, the problem when you're trying to do something like that is your hands are in the way, right? You know, it, it's really impossible to get a good shot of it. But Anyway, so here I am. Uh, now I've done the two interior nose ribs, uh, and I've moved it up onto the table, and I'm setting the ribs on the, the inboard most and outboard most, which, of course, the flanges are 
facing out so you can get out and move the squeezer, the pneumatic squeezer, and that's what I was doing there. Okay, so now I've got the left and right halves down on the floor, and at this point my wife and I have already put the substructure consisting of the front spar, uh, spar web, um, stringer web, sorry, and then spar ribs that I assembled in the last video down inside between the skin halves and I'm going in in place. So really now I'm kind of going from you know two halves of a stabilizer to one big 12 or 13 foot long airplane part. So uh, I've also you know kind of kind of here I've committed to assembling the rest of this thing on the floor and uh, most people would probably have it all up on a table with the cradles clamped to the table but I started thinking about it and I was going to be spending an awful lot of time either standing on a chair or climbing up on my table or on a stool or something to lean down in and, and be able to work, you know, reach down inside of the structure and decided that it might be easier to just do the whole thing on the floor and that way I could <laughs> scoot around on my little wheelie cart there and it just seemed like I'd have better access. So that's what I decided to do. So here I'm uh, installing the the blind rivets that hold the spar flange or sorry spar web to the rear flanges of the interior nose ribs so those are the nose ribs that I riveted into the skins earlier on and you know by installing these rivets it's kind of becoming official it's it's now one big stabilizer uh, one big part so these are blind rivets as I said they're LP4 3s I think LP4 3s or LP4 4s this is one of those places where there was just no way to design it where you could get access to the, the shop head of a rivet, of a solid rivet, to, to set it, to buck it or squeeze it or, or whatever. So they're blind rivets. Um, so you can see I'm using the, the hand-operated uh, blind rivet tool, squeezer, whatever you call it. And uh, yeah, I think there's six of these per side. And I have a pneumatic blind rivet gun as well, but uh, the, the cylinder on that thing, the pneumatic cylinder on that, would, wouldn't quite fit down inside uh, between the skins. So I just, I just went ahead and used a hand-operated one. I tried to get some real-time footage of setting one of these blind rivets with the hand squeezer, but of course now that I look at it, my hands are in the way, you can't really see too much. Uh, but here it is for what it's worth. All right, that was it. That's those. So here we are back to solid rivets, uh, to rivet the tip nose rib to the end of the spar. Um, here we see one of the disadvantages of doing this whole thing on the floor because now I find myself, uh, feels like I'm working on a car laying on the concrete. But that's okay, it didn't take too long, that one was easy. And uh, now I move on to the last couple of in-spar ribs. So, uh, you know, of course most of the in-spar ribs were attached to the, uh, the spar, the front spar, before the whole substructure was dropped down inside the skins but there were a couple uh, these last outer outboard couple uh, that are left off so that you have better access uh, you know to the inside for a second there and so now this uh, this second to last one is held on again with blind rivets and uh, so I go ahead and do that and then I move on to this last uh, outboard in spar rib and this one should be easy but I run into a bit of a problem here and it's a little bit difficult to describe and embarrassing because it, it doesn't seem like it should be a problem uh, but they're solid rivets and I'm trying to squeeze them with the squeezer and I find that for the for the ones that are sort of tucked up you know in the in the corners there the body of the squeezer interferes just enough with the edge of the skin and and the rib itself there's just no good way to hold it so that I feel like it's going to get a nice uh, you know perpendicular squeeze on this rivet uh, without causing it to, to clinch over. And so I solved this uh, by the time-honored tradition of chickening out and buying a new tool. 
So the tool you're about to see me try out for the first time on the plane here is a hand-operated squeezer. Uh, you can build the whole plane with these things. There's nothing really that special about this tool. I just, when I was ordering all my tools to start on this project, I knew that I was going to have a lot of dimples to, a lot of, a lot of rivets to squeeze and a lot of dimples to, to form. And so I skipped right over the hand squeezer and went with the pneumatic and you know, for the most part, that's the right decision. I'm still going to use the pneumatic on almost everything that it can possibly be used on. But as I said, I was having a couple of couple of spots where, you know, it was just a tight little area or something that you wouldn't think would be difficult to get at. But the fairly chunky body of the pneumatic squeezer, and it has to be big because it's got this big piston inside of it, it was getting in the way. And I'll admit, looking at this it doesn't look like this is a tight spot but it just was i was just having a little trouble so i went and got the handheld squeezer because even though it's you know the handle's pretty long of course uh, you got to get leverage on this thing but it's narrower and so what i ended up picking up was the cleveland aircraft tools main squeeze uh, hand squeezer it's admittedly pretty expensive for what it is uh, you can get a lot cheaper hand squeezers but I chose this one for a couple of reasons for one thing it accepts all the same uh, yokes and uh, yoke pins that I already had that I'm using with my pneumatic so some parts interchangeability there and then the second reason is that it does have this kind of nice cam system that gives you more of a mechanical advantage I think it's supposed to be take only like 60% of the force required by other squeezers so I did feel like that was an advantage. So anyway, that's the one I got. And uh, here I am about to give it a shot. Ah. Well, that tool works beautifully. Okay. So there we go. Obviously, I was very happy with the results. Uh, obviously, so was my wife, uh, based on the sound effects. I don't think she realized she was that close to the camera. But uh, so now I go ahead and, and do the other two rivets that hold this rib to the spar flange, the ones that are sort of tucked up in the corners. Uh, the whole reason I bought this thing in the first place and it worked out perfectly. It was it solved the problem that I needed to solve and uh, I actually really enjoyed using it. I uh, I think it has an advantage in terms of control. So the pneumatic, of course, you hit that the, the button, the, the lever, the trigger, whatever you want to call it, or step on the foot pedal, uh, as the case may be. And it goes, it squeezes. Um, you can feather it a little bit, but for the most part, like I say, you hit it and it goes. Whereas with this thing, you know, it's all you. You're you're squeezing. You can sort of feel what's going on. If you need to stop, you stop. Uh, you know, adjust something or whatever. And uh, you know, I really was happy with the results. So uh, I'm not gonna ditch the pneumatic. Obviously, when I'm doing hundreds of rivets along the rear spar flange or whatever, I'll I'll go back to the pneumatic. But, you know, for tight spots or places where I feel like I need a little extra control, I think the, the hand squeezer has its place. Um, I'm not selling these things. Uh, I just figured I would give my impressions. Uh, so I am glad that I, that I bought the tool.
All right, well, so enough of that. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up here. Next time, I'll be riveting skins to the spar and the rest of this structure, and then finally installing the rear spar. So thanks for watching.